start out by uh, reminding everyone this is the seventh of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Uh, I have uh, came to the first one, I think I missed maybe one, so this is number six for me. Uh, and every year I look forward to this for several reasons. The first time, the first reason for looking forward to the Heidelberg Laureate Forum is that I get to meet a whole new batch of students. Uh, 200 of them, so half of them from mathematics and half of them from computer science. And I get to see a lot of old friends that I don't see very often. Uh, and new people who have won prizes in the uh, preceding year uh, are often here. So uh, for me, it's a, a, a time both of reflection, uh, renewal, and uh, always excitement because there are new things going on. And in particular, uh, this uh, year, the, the heavy focus of attention has been on machine learning and artificial intelligence. One of the first uh, lecture that was given by Yosha Bengio, uh, who was the uh, winner of the uh, one of the three winners of the Turing Award, um, is simply reinforced. Uh, Simultaneously, my interest and excitement in machine learning uh, and uh, my disappointment that we haven't made better progress in what we'll call artificial general intelligence. Uh, today, we understand fairly well what we can do with these multi-layer neural networks. We can make them do some really interesting and surprising things, whether it's diagnosis of images uh, to detect uh, possible medical conditions or, uh, or playing uh, incredibly good games of Go or maybe controlling the cooling system of a, of a data center, which is something that uh, we've done at, uh, at Google. So we can see both the sort of whimsical and also extremely practical applications coming out of these techniques. But we've also discovered uh, through what are called generative uh, adversarial networks that these multi-layer neural networks are also brittle and fragile and they can be fooled. Uh, you can uh, change a few pixels of an image and instead of having uh, the, the machine learning system say, yes, this is a cat, it will tell you it's a fire engine. And it doesn't look like a fire engine to a human. The reason that these systems make such mistakes is that their conclusions are reached by looking at tiny little things called pixels, just you know, one tiny little bit of an image. All of the pixels of the image contribute to the weights that show up in the multi-layer neural network. But the network is only getting information at the pixel level. What it's not necessarily getting is a kind of notion of abstraction. Whereas when we look at an object, we sort of build abstract concepts around them, like cats have little triangular shaped ears and they're kind of fuzzy and they have a long tail. None of the neural networks actually recognize those features. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to make these systems uh, more robust. Uh, as we rely on them increasingly. So a big message that comes out of uh, this year's uh, Heidelberg Laureate Forum is making sure that we don't accidentally depend too heavily or give too much autonomy and decision-making capability to uh, a trained multi-layer neural network. Uh, this is particularly visible when we start using these systems and others to build self-driving cars, which are fully autonomous and are moving around on the streets trying to cope with human drivers uh, whose uh, actions are uh, often uh, unpredictable. And so it's one thing to train a system uh, to perform in a periodic and repeated uh, environment, one which is, uh, is fairly regular in character, and it's something else to get one to deal with dynamics that are unpredictable and changing. Uh, so uh, the other uh, lecture this morning, which had to do with ethics in general, which I strongly uh, uh, endorse, uh, suggests to me that as computer scientists, we have a lot to learn about developing uh, our systems with ethics in mind. Who is going to rely on this software that we, we build, whether it's machine learning or just simple, uh, simple software uh, inhabiting the Internet of Things? We have an ethical responsibility to make sure that the software behaves the way it should, it protects people's interests, its safety, their, their safety, their privacy, uh, and the, uh, their reliance on the devices that are being programmed. So computer scientists have a lot to learn, uh, I think, uh, to make their work uh, ethically solid. Uh, and that topic, I think, is going to come up more and more over time as more and more software becomes part of our daily environment. So I take away from, uh, from this Heidelberg Laureate Forum uh, a great deal of attention now that has to be paid to the social and economic effects of our work, 
in addition to its technical prowess. So I'll stop there uh, and invite questions from uh, the press. Yes, sir. Uh, I was interested to hear you start off talking about neural nets and machine learning because you're best known for networking, which makes me curious, what is, how, does, how do neural nets and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence, how does that affect your uh, research and your daily work? Well, I, I would say that the question is, is um, you know, well, how does neural networks affect my interest in networking? Uh, well, there is not a strong connection except for the fact that some neural networks might conceivably be used to make optimal routing decisions in a neural network structure, or using a neural network to make optimal routing uh, decisions. But even there, uh, in order for that to work, and I haven't tried to do that, uh, you would need to have uh, the routing system be somehow or other uh, statistically stable. Otherwise, you can't train the neural network to do anything optimal. So it's not 100% clear whether uh, the, the networks of today have enough stability in them to use a neural network. But it's a curious idea, so I will take that away, and if we see each other next year, I'll let you know whether it made any sense <laughs> to try that out. The reason I'm interested in it is simply that, first, it's the hot, new, shiny thing, and second, there's a lot of dependence being placed on it. I mean, people have gotten it. We're in the hyperbolic period of, uh, of machine learning. Uh, and lots of experiments are being tried, and many people are excited and, uh, about the potential. And uh, my purpose here is to make sure that we are careful about not over-relying on this shiny new technology while we think carefully about how to make it uh, reliable and safe to use. So, but thank you for the question. Okay, yes, please. You said that when you first, the, in the early days of the internet, privacy wasn't a big concern. And obviously today that cascaded into many problems. How do we make it so that machine learning and AI, how do we anticipate the problems that come from them, like the surveillance and the privacy? So uh, anticipating the problems that technology in will introduce is actually very hard. And I guess I would suggest to you, um, if you're familiar with the notion of emergent properties, you may know that some simple properties of a system, of a dynamic system, can produce very complex behaviors that we didn't anticipate. Um, as you uh, uh, design and build these systems, you begin to recognize where there might be opportunities for making it easier for the self-driving car to succeed. Mm -hmm. So you might ask, well, what might those things be? And I can give you one speculative thought. What if we said we should design roads so that only the self-driving cars are permitted on those roads and no human drivers. That might actually simplify the situation for the self-driving car. You might then add another idea, which is that the cars could communicate with each other. Human beings, when they're driving, don't communicate with each other very well. We give them some mechanisms for doing that, like turn signals. And we know that human beings, when they're driving, do talk to the other drivers, but the other drivers can't hear them. <laughs> and it's probably a good thing that the other drivers can't hear them. But the cars, having no ego, uh, could conceivably communicate in a very efficient, standardized way, like telling the other cars behind, I'm going to make a left turn in 100 feet, so I'm going to slow down, so don't be surprised. Uh, or I need to change lanes now, so please, everybody, allow me to do that. Um, if you know anything about a aviation, you know that we have air, uh, traffic controllers who are trying to help the planes coordinate and not run into each other. There are some small airports where there are no traffic controllers. And so the pilots get on a common channel. And if there are multiple aircraft in the uh, unmanned airports, they negotiate with each other about who is going to land and who is going to take off. And they all agree. They have some consensus mechanism. So I can imagine the self-driving cars, uh, our decision to design uh, the self-driving cars to have, take advantage of some of these coordinating mechanisms, which would probably not work with humans, but it would work with the cars because we can write the software, and in theory the cars will execute the software faithfully. So maybe there's a, a little element of your going from the complex to the simple. Okay, other questions? Yes, way in the back, please. Um, I'm asking for a Bulgarian journalist who can't be here. She wanted to know, you a few years ago pitched the idea of interplanetary internet, and she wanted to know what's your thoughts on that? Has it developed? Um, yeah. 
Thank you for asking that because uh, that's another thing I'm still very excited about. At this point, we now have the prototype software is still running on Mars in the orbiters and on the, on the uh, landed uh, rovers. And as you know, we've now sent several spacecraft to Mars onto the surface. There's uh, spirit and opportunity have basically stopped working, but the Mars Science Laboratory and the Curiosity are there, and we have more things planned in the 2020s. The second thing is that uh, we have the most recent standardized versions of the protocols are running on the International Space Station now. They're being used by the astronauts. A couple of years ago, we tested those protocols in real time, driving a small rover here in Heidelberg uh, around under the control of an astronaut. And the only reason we could do that is that the, the distance between the International Space Station and Heidelberg is fairly short, and so there's low latency. So if you turn the steering wheel on the International Space Station, the wheels turn very quickly on the little rover. That doesn't work from here to Mars because the, the round, tri round trip time delays could be up to 40 minutes. And you can't imagine driving a car where you turn the steering wheel and 40 minutes later the wheels turn. So we need, but we needed to know that the protocols would work in both low latency in real time and also handle the high latency. The other thing that we recently did was a uh, test using an optical transmission uh, bouncing off of the moon. Uh, so it was at 600 megabits a second. Now the moon distance is still fairly close, it's about two and a half seconds round trip time. But the fact that we could run the protocol at 600 megabits a second using an optical laser was very satisfying because it suggests that when we start using lasers instead of radios to, uh, to communicate information back and forth from the spacecraft that are in the rest of the uh, solar system, uh, that we'll be able to get more data back. So at, at this point, it's my understanding that uh, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, the Korean Space Agency, and NASA have all agreed to uh, make use of the interplanetary protocols that have now been standardized in spacecraft that are being built uh, after 2020. And so in uh, the American program, uh, one of the more exciting new developments is called Gateway. Uh, and if you follow that one, it's a spacecraft, and possibly an aggregated one, just like the International Space Station is an aggregate of components. Gateway will be an aggregate of components in a very eccentric orbit around the moon. And so roughly speaking, you, uh, uh, you leave Earth, and, and then rendezvous with the Gateway spacecraft, and then ride the Gateway spacecraft to the moon, and then take a shuttle down to the moon. Hmm. And then you do whatever you have to do, and when the spacecraft comes back, you take the shuttle back up, and then you ride the Gateway spacecraft and pick up uh, another spacecraft and get, to get back to Earth. So it's like having escalators uh, in the sky. Uh, those systems, we hope, are also going to make use of the interplanetary protocols. So at this point, the idea is alive and well, and it's beginning to propagate. Can I just ask a follow-up? What do you mean with we? And the time frame that you, if you say recently, um, yeah, who's the we? I didn't understand the question. Um, you said we are... Uh, oh, when I say we, this yeah. is, this is uh, yeah, it's not Google. Google allows me to do these things, but this is part of, this is NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I have a, an appointment at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a visiting scientist, and, and that's where I have been doing my interplanetary work. So Google is not planning to take over the solar system right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you had a question, yes. Yeah, I'm in conversation with an editor at the Best in Class Children's Magazine Highlights, and they're often interested in stories about how differences can actually advance science. And I've read about how, um, as a child, you know, in your life you've had hearing loss, so I've wondered if you could comment on that, because I've read that that's actually been part of the motivation that allowed you a to sort think of a driver. Of, yeah. Uh, so, uh, it, this is not a true story, the, 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 the one thing that people imagine is that because I'm hearing impaired and my wife has two cochlear implants and was deaf for 50 years before she got her implants, that somehow I got involved in electronic mail to help my wife. Uh, there's, a, there's some truth to that, but it took me forever to get her comfortable using a computer because she's an artist. And so, in fact, it wasn't me that got her to use the computer. It was her book club who said it was a lot easier to communicate with her using email than phone calls. 
So I had no effect, no matter how long I tried to get her. It was her book club that got her to do that. It did have an effect on me, though, because I'm hearing impaired, and I've been wearing hearing aids since I was 13, so I can tell you that's over 60 years now, um, that when electronic mail came along around 1971, when the ARPANET project was underway, uh, I jumped on that as a really wonderful tool to uh, help communicate with my colleagues instead of trying to do phone calls, especially conference calls. So I tended to choose uh, jobs that uh, also had electronic mail available. And so I, I mean, either consciously or unconsciously, uh, I would navigate in the direction of a job that involved, uh, a, a, had electronic mail available. So when I left uh, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, after having done the internet design, I joined a company called MCI, and the first thing I did was build their email system called MCI Mail. Uh, and that was very helpful because I got to use email in order to uh, do my work at the company. And that's been true you know, for the rest of my career. Uh, I am, however, very interested in technology helping people with disabilities. Uh, and I see this as uh, augmenting people's capabilities or at the very least uh, accommodating whatever uh, deficiencies that they might have to overcome. I can tell you that almost everyone I know who has any disability, whether they're blind or they're stuck in a wheelchair or they can't hear, do not wake up in the morning thinking, I'm disabled. They don't think that. They know that there are things they can't do that they might need help doing, just like I need to have hearing aids. If I take them off, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But that's a question of augmenting your capability or recovering a capability in order to function, in my case, in a hearing world. Um, so it's very important for employers to understand that the focus of a person's attention is not on their disability, it's on what they can do. And that's what employers should be thinking. They should be thinking, okay, so what can this person do that's relevant to me? And what accommodation might I need to offer in order to allow them to do what they can do and to overcome whatever dis you know, deficiencies they have to be dealt with, whether it's as simple as putting a ramp at the doorway so they can get the wheelchair up the ramp. Uh, so from my point of view, um, these are important ideas because there are a lot of people out there, especially ones that get older like me, uh, who will experience some of those disabilities. Well, this has led me to one other conclusion, and that is that um, I almost hope that everybody in the world will have a temporary disability so that they recognize what they can't do during that period of time. So uh, the, uh, the wife of one of the uh, Turing Award winners was here last year and she had both hands, uh, both arms had been broken. She fell and broke both arms at the same time. And uh, so she was not able to do quite a long list of things that she normally would do. I asked her if she would please write down the things that she discovered she couldn't do and needed help with until her broken arms healed. And it was quite a long list. And she was surprised when she made this list about all the things she took for granted that she would normally just do without thinking that suddenly she needed help for. Now, Thankfully, her arms have healed and she's back doing whatever she needs to do. But I wanted everybody to have that experience so they begin to appreciate why assistive technology is helpful and why it's important to make it available. So that sort of doesn't quite answer your question, but it gets around to a point that I did want to make, which is that assistive technology is really important. And for a person like me who's a computer scientist, it's embarrassing that we have not managed to take computers, which are among the most versatile things we've ever invented, and make them do a better job of accommodating people's needs when it comes to assistive technology. For example, higher contrast, larger fonts, um, it, it, uh, keyboards that, uh, that have a, are better for people who have mobility problems. There are just a wide range of assistive technologies that we should be incorporating into all of our applications. So the, the people at Google hear me beating all the time on this. The problem that we encounter for most programmers is that their intuition for what makes something useful and uh, as, you know, uh, provides assistance, their intuitions are not very good because they haven't lived with the problem. So they don't really know 
what it is that, that is required to design something that is uh, helpful. And so there we have a lot of work to do to teach people how to do uh, systems that are usable by design. And that, I think, is a big challenge for all of us. I saw a hand coming up over here. Is that, is that okay? Yes, thank all right. you. Did you have your hand up? No? No, okay, yes. So you mentioned at the beginning uh, the social and ethical implications of the work today of researchers. And I know you also work with the digital, uh, digital or dark age, which would be yes. the idea of yes. losing information because of outdated formats and so on. The problem is that we do not know in history what information we lost because we lost it. <laughs> I love this. Uh, yes. So that's what that's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> But however, the, the question is, what do you think is the most valuable information that may be lost? Uh, are there uh, political or economic or economical or ethical implications by losing information this way? So let me give you um, some concrete examples of the challenge which I see and the, and the risks that we have. Um, I think the last time we had this conversation, I might have mentioned uh, a book uh, by uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin called A Team of Rivals. This is her story about Abraham Lincoln, our president during our Civil War in the mid-19th century, hired onto his cabinet the people that competed with him for the presidency, which is why the title of the book is A Team of Rivals, because they were rivals. Um, the book is extraordinary because the author reproduces conversations among the principals. And it reads as if she was there in 1860, but we're pretty sure that she wasn't. <laughs> so the question is, how could she have written such a credible sounding dialogue? And the answer is that she went to libraries around the US and found the letters that were exchanged by the principals, and so she could see not only what they talked about, but how they talked about it and what positions they took. And so she was in a position in writing the book to address the various topics using the words of the principals that she had read in their letters. So then I started imagining, well, what if there was a 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin And she was interested in writing about the first few decades of the 21st century. What would she find? Where would her source material be? And when I think of the tweets and the Facebook pages and the emails and all the other social networking things that go on, where will those digital objects be in 100 years' time? And I think the answer is they may not be around at all unless somebody recognizes that it's important. Now, in the United States, and this is probably true in other countries, uh, it is uh, a requirement of our national archives that they capture uh, the um, official transactions of the administration. So, uh, they certainly all have access to Mr. Trump's tweets, if that's publicly available. Uh, but there are lots of other documents, and the law says you must keep track of and record all of the actions that take place so that that can become part of the record. So the National Archives, at the end of an administration, receives uh, disk drives uh, or references to, uh, to cloud systems of files that are representative of the uh, administration's actions. I think that, in, that we have to, to be consciously um, determined to make sure that whatever format those things are in can be ingested and properly recorded and indexed and everything else. In the past, it's been hard copy, which is still hard to index and organize, but at least you don't lose it in a cloud of bits that just disappear. Uh, it's much worse if they're in uh, digital form, because you may not have the software that's necessary to even render it. So, for example, you know, the PDF format is widely used on the you know, presumption and hope that there will be software available to correct a render the PDFs a hundred years from now. Of course, the more pessimistic people print this stuff out on paper. The trouble with that is that not all of the digital artifacts that are important can be printed on paper. What if it's video? What if it's audio? What if it's an interactive program? What if it was a 
program that was modeling the economy and was trying to make sure that we don't end up with another big deep recession. And so the piece of software needed to be part of the record. That piece of software won't be useful unless we can still execute the software and the operating system that ran on it. So I am still very, very worried that we don't have our arms around a plan to make sure that digital content that should be part of the record will be kept as part of the record. And that doesn't address the problem that each of you have. You have mobiles with you, you take lots of photographs, no doubt, uh, and you may have families that uh, you want to share this information with, and you have descendants like children and grandchildren who might want to know something about your life. Uh, where, who's taking care of that? How are you making sure that that data is going to be available to them? It's, you can't just put pieces of paper in a shoebox and hand it to them. Well, you can, but then that doesn't deal with all the other letters and the pictures that you took. So, so that's what I think we're still struggling with this. It's not a solved problem. Okay, other question. Yes? Oh, yes? I, it, did well, anyone I think, else? I didn't okay. see any yeah, no, no, I'll solve so, again. Yeah. Um, I'm working on another article about uh, the underrepresentation of women among Turing Award winners. I think I spoke about it the other night. I'm wondering if you have any insight about that. Okay, so I, uh, until recently, I sat uh, as the, the co-chair of all of the ACM awards. There were some 37 committees that uh, that, uh, that uh, John uh, White and I oversaw. I stepped down from that. We have another co-chair, uh, but I spent quite a few years. Uh, scratching my head, uh, trying to figure out how can we redress this problem. Well, there are uh, two particular uh, issues here. The first one is that there were fewer women taking computer science and therefore uh, even eligible for consideration for some of these major prizes. Uh, and the second problem was getting them nominated. Uh, and we're trying to redress this problem in two or three ways. The first one is giving much more visibility wherever we can to women who are succeeding in doing really high quality work in computer science. And I think we're making some progress there. The second thing is to make sure that the committees have representation for men and women and other, uh, uh, other uh, ethnic uh, components so that we get their points of view into the committee process. The third thing is to deliberately think about these, these committees that are the ones who uh, award prizes rely on nominations that come in. They don't just make this up out of thin air. But this doesn't stop them from deliberating about are there people that they know uh, should be considered and should be nominated and can they find someone to nominate them? We don't allow the committee members to make nominations because that would be a conflict of interest. But it's okay to find other people to make the nominations. And so we've been trying to uh, prime the pump, so to speak, by having the committees pay more attention to uh, encouraging nominations, you know, and, and again, in accordance with this broad uh, desire to have all the people uh, represented that should be. Great. So I hope, I, I still worry that the stereotypes uh, of various professions are very badly skewed. And so there was a, a, an experiment was done uh, today or yesterday uh, when some of the laureates went to the schools. I went to one of the high schools and one of the laureates asked the students, the high school students, gymnasium here, uh, if they would draw a picture of a scientist, every single picture was male. Every single one. Well, that was disappointing, but the person who asked the question had the opportunity to point out how terribly skewed that was and how wrong it was. Now, I can tell you in other uh, professions besides mathematics and computer science, we do see a significant shift. So I was sitting at graduation ceremonies at University of Southampton about two years ago. And you know they had the computer science people and there were one or two women. And there were the mathematics people and there were one or two women. Then came biology and there were a whole bunch of women. So the sciences are more welcoming apparently. Uh, some sciences are more welcoming than others. Physics, lots of men, not so many women. So uh, my view is that we should be 
um, thinking very hard about stereotypes, uh, even to the point of going to places like Hollywood and saying, stop showing scientists as, you know, having crazy hair and white beards, and, or no hair, and white beards and a white coat, and, uh, and let's show what real science, scientists look like. That they don't all look like that. And so shifting the stereotype might help a bit as well. Great, thank you. So you can help. In fact, every, everybody in this room can help by trying to undo the stereotypes that people have in their heads about what makes a scientist. And it's not uh, a Y chromosome. <laughs> okay, other questions? Yes, sir. What do you think the, the future of the Internet is going to be? So just, oh, so this is a very general question. What's going to happen next? Okay. You choose, you choose to show it. Well, first of all, you understand that my ability to predict the future of the internet has been demonstrated to be fairly bad. Um, you know, like we ran out of address space and we had to do IP version 6, uh, which has not been propagating as, as much as I would like. Uh, I think we can, we can see several things that are happening. The first one is that the milestone was reached in December of about half of the world's population has access to the Internet. Uh, if you were to get up in a satellite and kind of look at the, at the surface of the Earth and ask, where is the Internet? It's not like uh, there are a collection of countries where it's 100% accessible and a whole bunch of countries where it isn't. It's more like every country has some Internet and every country has places where there isn't any access. And almost always, the place where there isn't any access is in the rural parts of the country, away from the cities. Part of the reason for that is that the populations are sparse, which means that you can, if you're going to bring communications out to them, it doesn't serve as many people, so you don't generate as much revenue from the expense. So there's always this problem of asymmetry in terms of cost. But how do we deal with that? One thing we can try to do is drive cost out by making things less expensive. Uh, but a second thing is to find alternative ways of providing access that uh, is more uh, uniform. Uh, so I can tell you that there is more attention being paid to getting people in the rural parts of, of the world onto online. But the most dramatic thing, two, two dramatic things are happening. One dramatic thing is that there is an increase dramatic increase in the number of optical fiber uh, cables under the, under the sea, undersea cables are going all over the place, they're growing rapidly, the costs are coming down, so more of them are being built. And there are islands in the Pacific, for example, that are connected by undersea fiber that I never would have expected would happen. I mean, I would have lost money on the bet. So that surprised me when you look at the maps. But the more exciting possibility and, and also one which sounds a little crazy, uh, is putting lots and lots of satellites up in low and very low Earth orbit. So you know that SpaceX and Elon Musk is planning to put some 11 or 12,000 satellites in orbit between around 700 to 1,000 kilometers up. That's very close to the Earth, so the latencies are very small, and the data rates will be high because they're close closer to Earth, and so they get more signal-to-noise ratio for the power that they have available. There are others, there's one web, and there are several others who are planning to put thousands of satellites in orbit. If they succeed in doing this, and some of them are already up there, O3b has 12 satellites in equatorial orbit at uh, 8,000 kilometers, I've talked to you about that in the past. Uh, the uh, Musk plan, the Starlink system, has 60 satellites that have been launched already as a test. If they get them up there, it will be impossible to avoid access to the Internet because satellites will be in um, uh, polar orbit, and that means that they will cross every part of the globe in multiple planes. And so that would be wonderful, actually, because for the scientists who happen to be at the South Pole, it's been very hard to get data back because you can't use the synchronous satellites because when you're at the North Pole, you can't see the satellites that are in equatorial orbit because they're you know, below the horizon. So we're having these polar orbit uh, satellites will open up a huge amount of capacity, which will turn out to be really important for science. You know, think about the uh, telescopes that are going to go up into the high in the Andes like the uh, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope will be producing petabytes of data, 
which we have to get back to the astronomers in order to uh, do the analysis to say what are they seeing out there. So I'm very excited about this, if it works. Who, who is doing that? Okay, so SpaceX uh, is a company that makes rocket boosters, is also planning to put thousands of satellites in orbit. Uh, there is a group called OneWeb um, that is, uh, is planning a similar thing. Um, what did I just hear? I heard that Iridium is doing something uh, with another uh, group. You Amazon. Remember? With, uh, with, it, 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 oh, uh, Amazon yeah, what do they call them? What do they do? Blue Origin, I think it's called. What, I'm sorry? Blue Origins? Yeah, well, Blue Origins is the name of the company. Yeah. But I don't know whether they have a name for their satellite constellation, right. but you're quite right. Amazon's company. Right. Well, it's actually not Amazon's company. It's, it's yeah, Jeff, Jeff Bezos', Bezos company. Right. Uh, at Blue Origins that also wants to put up a constellation of satellites. So now there is a um, downside to this. I mean, apart from not being able to escape access to the internet, uh, the the other downside is that the astronomers are starting to get worried about the amount of stuff up there that might interfere with optical tel uh, telescopes because you have streets where all the satellites are going, or the possibility of radio interference. So there's some, a, a lot of arm wrestling going on about the design of those systems. But I have to say, as Google's chief internet evangelist, whose primary uh, desire is to get everybody online, I hope they succeed, because that solves my problem, then I can retire and go off and do something else. <laughs> yes, sir, way in the back. Um, on, on the subject of gender bias, yes. what's your take on Larry Samuelson's uh, explanation when he was uh, president of Harvard who said men and women on average have the same IQ but four or five standard deviations out to the right there are more men? My understanding is that this was uh, exists for that and so I don't, it sounds to me like this was wishful thinking for reasons I don't understand <laughs> But I don't think there's any evidence for that conclusion. He, he should have said that four or five standard deviations to the left, there are also more men. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, it, precisely right. So there may be some substantially smarter people than these. Uh, so as, as I say, I don't think there's any evidence for that position at all. He's roundly criticized uh, for that. I don't no, know of anyone who supports it. In terms it. of free speech, I mean, uh, he had to resign afterwards. Uh, was it right to, to give him the right to say that, or...? Uh, oh, well, as you know, I come from a tradition in the United States where freedom of speech is widely supported, even speech that you don't agree with and don't like and makes you angry. Um, there are limits. There are limits to free speech. Another example of something which is very worrisome for, for me, and the side effects of it have been very apparent, uh, some people have made the assertion that vaccinations are the cause of autism. There is no evidence for this at all, nothing. In fact, if anything, it's the complete opposite. And yet there are people who believe this disinformation. And the consequence of that is that they don't have their children vaccinated, and the children catch measles, and they spread measles around, which we haven't had in, this, in the US for decades. Suddenly now we have epidemics. And so that's utterly irresponsible. And the question then is, what should you do about it? The normal reaction to this is, well, more information should help, except that we're now inundated by information and we're struggling to decide which information should we reject and which information should we accept and how can we tell. It, it doesn't work to, um, to do kind of polling of the population to see who believes this and who believes that. The reason that doesn't work is that now we have these things called bots. They're programs that pretend to be people. And it's getting easier and easier to make a program pretend to be a person. In fact, let me try this on you. If you remember what the Turing test was. It, he had several variations, but the basic idea was a human being is interrogating a computer and another human being. And just with these written exchanges, the human is trying to figure out which one is the computer and which one is the human. And if the computer succeeds in fooling the person into thinking that it's a human being, then the computer has passed the Turing test. So that was, that was Turing's basic test. You remember a uh, 
movie was made called The Imitation Game, which was about that test. I have Turing Test 2, which I just made up. I'm a computer, and I'm interrogating a computer and a human being, and on the basis of my exchanges, remember I'm just a program, uh, on the basis of my exchanges I'm trying to figure out, is this a computer or is this a human? And so, what, remember that the computer is seeing these exchanges through the filter of protocols on the internet. And it doesn't have the same facility that even a human being has to get subtleties and things like that. To make matters worse, when we try to make the distinction between a human and a computer in this online environment, we offer these challenges like CAPTCHAs. Remember the, it's, it's a long acronym, but basically it's a test that's supposed to figure out whether the thing on the other side is a human or a computer. And so you know how annoying those tests are. I mean, sometimes it'll be an array of pictures, and they'll say, click on all the pictures that have a car in them. You know, and, and you look at this thing and you think, well, does that look like a tailpipe of a car or not? And does that count or not? And then when you fail the test, you get very angry, and you do it twice, and then you get more angry, and then you throw your computer through the window. So we have not done a very good job. And so now coming back to the key question, uh, the fact that we have trouble telling the difference between a human and a computer means that if we're polling a system and some computers are pretending to be people, they can be programmed to take whatever position somebody wants them to take. And so we get disinformation spreading through the system looking as if uh, it is a widely held view, even though it's only held by a few people plus a whole bunch of bots. So we can't use our normal tools to filter it. So guess what? We're challenged, we're, we're privileged to have access to all this information. Google is proud to run a search engine to help you find it. But we have a problem as users to figure out of all the information we found, what should we reject. So what do we have in our hands to deal with this? We have something called wetware. And so our brains have to be trained to think critically about what we're seeing and hearing. This is not the first time you've heard me say this. Uh, so I'm a big fan of critical thinking. And that's the core of the scientific method when you think about it. So critical thinking says, oh, here's an assertion. Um, <coughs> is there any evidence that backs up the assertion? Like the Larry Sumner question you asked. <coughs> Could I get some water? Or vodka? Or, you know, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so we have to ask questions like, where did the information come from? Is there corroborating evidence? Who put this up there? Are they trying to get me to believe something that I don't want to believe? I need to, to tease my way through that. I need to find resources to uh, validate the data. And it, it's okay. Uh, so I think we have to work on that, and I think companies like mine need to work on helping people find useful information to figure out what is or isn't uh, reasonable. Uh, now, there is one other problem. This is, this is the problem that the scientists have. Let's imagine that uh, 10 years ago, you came to me, I'm, I'll pretend I'm a scientist, and, uh, and you've come to me and you said, what should I do? And I say, well, you should do X for some value of X. And so you thank me very much because I have this expertise, and so you take my advice. And ten years later, you come back and you say, well, you know, I've been following your advice, uh, but, you know, what do you think about it now? And I say to you, well, I've had ten years to study this problem, and I've come to the conclusion that you should not do X, you should do Y, for some value of Y. And uh, you look at me, now some people will say, oh, thank you for the benefit of the extra 10 years of, of expertise. But some people will say, so you lied to me 10 years ago. And scientists will say, no, no, I didn't lie to you. I, I told you to the best of my ability what my theory was and, and what uh, research I had done to support the theory. And 10 years later, I discovered that Y is more accurate than X was. But there are some people who will say, you lied to me, and then, then they say they won't accept Y either because you lied about X, so why should they believe you about Y? This is a terrible dilemma for scientists 
because a good scientist accepts the possibility that his favorite theory, or her favorite theory, is wrong. It just looked good until you were able to measure something better, and then it tells you that the theory didn't work, and this new measurement tells you you need a new theory. So scientists are willing to give up their favorite theories. Some aren't. I mean, some will cling to them, you know, forever. Uh, but most good scientists are prepared for that. But most people are not because they imagine that science means truth. And, you know, any good scientist will tell you, at best, science is the best approximation we have to the truth right now. But getting that concept into people's heads and getting them to use that for critical thinking, that's not so easy, which is why I think we should be teaching young people, children, how to think critically so by the time they grow up, they, don't, they, they can distinguish, or at least try to distinguish, good quality and bad quality information. And by the way, this is important not just for the internet. Movies, radio, television, your friends and your parents are all potential sources of bad information. Uh, that latter point, by the way, causes trouble. Uh, when, uh, when I try to encourage teachers to teach children how to think critically, and the kids learn how to do that, and then they come home and they start asking, you know, pointed questions about their parents' opinions. Some of the parents don't like that. And so they don't like the idea of critical thinking because their kids have come home and criticized them. Um, well, that's sociology for you. Okay, other questions. Oh my God, we got a million more. Oh, okay, well, let's take somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. That would be you. Uh, also, on the gender imbalance issue, uh, what do you think? Well, the development of, of LGBT population are even less uh, privileged than women in, in the 21st century because it seems that nobody discussed this well in so, the science community. Uh, actually, this is, this, uh, the question basically has to do with whether women are underprivileged in many dimensions, in many societies, and does that lead to some of the problems? The answer is absolutely yes. And that is known. That, by the way, is not a secret. Uh, it is it's well understood, although not adequately addressed, that many women in many cultures are simply not allowed to be educated, or they are not given the opportunity to be educated, uh, or they're not given the opportunity to take initiatives on their own. That is a social and a cultural problem. This is not, not something that I know how to solve, you know, technically. Uh, the only thing I could say, you know, looking at this from my perspective is that uh, as a network uh, computer scientist, is that anything that could be done to uh, open up access to knowledge to women uh, is a good thing. And I remember uh, a former Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security in the United States, Jane Lute, tried to summarize the problems that she saw in the world, one of which was underemployment and the other one was under education. And she said, the solution to the world's problem is to put the men to work and educate the women. <laughs> and, you know, there, of course that's not exactly the total, the total solution, but there's such a kernel of truth to what she is saying. Because people who aren't working, first of all, are not performing from the uh, economic point of view, and they probably feel like they're not contributing to the society. And the women who are undereducated know they're undereducated, and want to be uh, active members of the society, and they need it. So I guess we just ran out of time. Is that right? Well, we we can do one more. Okay. Um, so way in the back there, yes. Do you think that science and religion are connected? I'm, I can't quite hear you. Do you think that science and religion are connected or not connected? So. Um, First of all, the answer is absolutely, uh, because we see a lot of, uh, sometimes we see tensions, and sometimes we see prominent scientists who are also very strongly religious. Uh, there's the Templeton um, Foundation. If you don't know about it, you might want to look into that, because they, are, they offer prizes for scientists to show how religion and science can work together and can, can be resolved and be made consistent. Um, Let's see, there is one of the most, it's a one million dollar prize, by the way, it's a big deal. Uh, the, the person that I seem to remember uh, getting it, I'm embarrassed, his name has gone out of my head. Uh, my 
chief of staff is my friend here. She's looking it up on Google. This is um, uh, Alice. Say again. Alice. I can't hear. P L L I S. Ellis? Yeah. No, no. It's uh, it's uh, it's the father of the gal who was the first chairman of ICANN. And the first chairman of ICANN was... Freeman Dyson? Yeah. I'm sorry, she was... Freeman Dyson? Yeah, Free, yeah, Freeman. Thank you. No, Freeman wasn't the chairman. It's his daughter who was chairman of ICANN. Freeman was the winner. Thank you. This is my Alzheimer's are showing. Uh, so Freeman Dyson got the award. So now let me come back to your question. The, the, you should read his stuff. He's really good. So first of all, if you think about um, science, the way I do anyway, uh, it is a kind of religion because I have a fundamental belief in the scientific method. So when people ask if I'm religious, I tell them I'm geek orthodox. Evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, what else would it? Be? Yes, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so I don't think that they are irreconcilable. I think that you, if you read the Bible, uh, any variations on this, or the Quran, or any of the other religious, famous religious writings. Uh, that it's pretty important to remember where they came from, how they were produced, uh, and that they are, in many cases, uh, metaphors and, uh, and stories that are intended to have an effect, but they may not be literally uh, true. Uh, and for some people, uh, that's not comfortable. For some people, you know, things have to be absolutely literally true or they're uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not that way. I'm happy with metaphor. I'm comfortable with uh, understanding things in, in that way. And so science and, and I, mean, I think that there is order in the universe. I think that there, it can be understood. I think it's hard to understand because every time we think we know what we're doing, we discover we're wrong. If you just, just look at this arc, you know, Newton comes along and he figures out gravity and now we think that we know exactly how the universe works and we We've measured all the physical constants, and if we just measure them more accurately, we can predict everything. That was uh, 100 years ago. And then Einstein comes along and he blows up Newton. And then, the, uh, the, the, then, then people come along uh, with quantum theory and they blow up Einstein. And then the string theory guys come along and they blow up the quantum guys. And now what do we have? We have a universe which is accelerating its expansion and we say, why is that? And the scientists say, well, it's dark energy. And we say, what's that? And they say, I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then we say, uh, oh, you know, the galaxies would normally just blow apart because the mass of the galaxy measured by all the stars is insufficient to hold it together based on Newton's gravity. So why don't they blow apart? Well, because there's dark matter that's holding them together. Well, what's that? We don't know. So when you do the math, you discover that we know about 5% of the universe, and the other 95% we have labels on, we have no idea what they mean. So when children come and they say, what should they do? What should they study? I tell them, study astrophysics, because we don't know anything. And so anything they do will probably get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay, that's all the time we got. Thank you very much.